Well, okay, that's all fine, but the war is going to be fought on the ground. And um, the first battle of any real significance takes place um, in July 1861, what we call the Battle of Bull Run. By the way, it can be confusing reading about this because every civil, many Civil War battles have two names. Confederates name battles after the nearest river, and uh, no, I guess it was the Northerners who named them after the nearest river, and Confederates named after the nearest town. So the Bull Run is a creek, but the Confederates called it the Battle of Manassas. Same battle, Manassas, Bull Run. Confusing. But anyway, um, let's see if we can find what we're talking about here. Much of the war, much of it takes place in this 90 mile area uh, here uh, between um, Washington, D.C., and Richmond, and the area of Virginia around that. Here's Manassas. Can you see right there? Manassas is very close to Washington, D.C., or Bull Run, if we want to call it that. And, um, you know, troops are gathering in Washington, a lot of troops, and people are yelling, let's go, let's go, on to Richmond. Greeley's Tribune is publishing articles, on to Richmond, let's march on Richmond. Um, in command at Washington is General Irwin McDowell, uh, a you know West Point general, quite understandably not that interested in going out and fighting with a giant rabble of untrained men who are milling around. That's his army. Um, they haven't been trained yet. They haven't been molded into shape. But there's tremendous pressure. And by the way, the Confederates are also untrained and disorganized. And um, so eventually, McDowell decides to march down into Virginia and confront the Confederate Army, which has been gathering there. And Manassas Junction, which was a little railroad junction about 30 miles southwest of Washington, these two armies met. By the way, as I said, in the romantic view of war at the beginning, many, many hundreds of sightseers, tourists, congressmen, people in wagons, people with picnics, followed the army in order to observe the battle. They figured there's going to be one battle, the war will be over, we might as well take a look at it. So you have this kind of large crowd coming along with the army to observe the battle. And the battle takes place, and you know, one, uh, one could go on to the, all the maneuvers, but basically it's sort of a stalemate until reinforcements arrive on the southern side and they push the um, Union forces back. And when that happens, the Union lines break and the soldiers panic, and they all run helter-skelter back to Washington. It's a good way. It's 30 miles, but you can do that if you're scared. Um, <laughs> with the spectators and congressmen and others in hot pursuit. So it becomes a debacle, the battle, the first battle of Bull Run. A few radicals were there. Ben Wade, the radical senator from um, Ohio, tried to stop the retreat. He tried to stand in the road and almost got himself trampled to death. Um, by the retreating group. So this was July 21st, 1861. It, 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 strategically, it was insignificant. Uh, the forces ended up exactly as they had started. But more people were killed at Bull Run than any battle in American history up to that time. 800 dead on taking together. That's not a lot, as we'll see later, but still, it's more than in any other single battle that the United States have fought. It's a warning that this war is not is going to be something quite different from what um, people uh, may have uh, thought. It's not going to be a short lark. Um, the battle act did not lead to panic in the North. It actually led to greater resolve to now mobilize better and you know and and um, build up the army. It raised the specter of a threat to Washington because maybe the Confederate forces could have just marched up and seized Washington uh, and led to a lot of discussion all through the rest of the war of how best to defend Washington. Um, and it also led in Congress to the passage of what we call the Crittenden Resolution. Remember Crittenden from Kentucky? Crittenden issues a resolution which passes both houses almost unanimously. This is July 1861. This war is not waged in any spirit of oppression for the purpose of conquest or, for, or of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or established institutions of the South. The war is not directed against slavery. That's what the Crittenden Resolution says. It's passed almost unanimously. 
In the House, only two radical Republicans vote against it, although quite a few abstain. Um, but Thaddeus Stevens, the great radical in the House, who actually does abstains, doesn't vote against it, then gets up and says, some gentlemen have an, have an idea that our, our enemies, being rebels, will surrender in the course of a few months. On the contrary, I believe that many thousands of valuable lives will be lost and millions of money will be expended. The only question is whether the government is prepared to meet these perils. So on the one hand, the radicals are isolated, partly because they've been pressing for an immediate advance. But on the other hand, right after the Crittenden resolution, the House passes a resolution put forward by Owen Lovejoy, a radical from Illinois, that the army should not return fugitive slaves. As we'll see in a minute, fugitive slaves have been showing up at army camps. The law is they had to be returned, Fugitive Slave Act. The House now passes a, a, a measure, the army should not return fugitive slaves. It never gets to the Senate, it doesn't become law at this point, it eventually does, but it shows a hardening of opinion already, despite the proposal, on slavery. Lincoln issues now a call for 500,000 troops to serve for three years, not three months. So the whole concept of the war has been transformed by this one battle of Bull Run. Forget about three months. 500,000 men, an incredible amount, number of men for three years. So this is going to be a serious, big, long war. And in August, Congress passes the, what we call the First Confiscation Act. The First Confiscation Act. Basically freeing the slave, freeing slaves who are working for the Confederate Army. In other words, the Confederate Army is using slave labor. They're using slaves to build fortifications. They're using slaves to build roads. They're using slave labor. That, that's the labor. Any slave who is working directly for military purpose can be seized by the Union Army and freed. Now, you know, on the one hand, this recognizes them as property. Property of the enemy used for military purpose can be seized in a war. You can't, you're not supposed to seize civilian property, but if you come upon their cannons or something, you can seize them. Slaves as property being used for military purposes can be seized but freed. They're no longer slaves anymore once they're seized by the Union Army. This opens the door. This is the first step toward emancipation. Why did it happen?